Welcome. This is the February 21, 2023 regular meeting uh, for the Township Board for the uh, excuse me for the Charter Township of Meridian. Um, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and the main standing afterwards. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask you to remain standing so that in solidarity with the rest of the MSU family, uh, this board would like to ask you to join, join us in a moment of silence. Thank you. And to end this um, observance, we will have a rendition of the shadows.
Mr. Lamaster, would you call the roll for us? Supervisor. Here. Clerk Guthrie. Here. Treasurer DeShane. Here. Trustee Hendrickson. Here. Trustee Sundland. Here. Trustee Wilson. Here. Trustee Wazinski. Here. All present. Thank you. Item 6B, um, item 6 on our agenda is presentations. We have several tonight. And we will start with a um, presentation by Chief Plaga and Chief Hamill in response to questions about how um, Meridian Township responded to the events at Michigan State. Madam Supervisor, board members, thank you. Uh, we had an entire shift respond to the university. There were three of the first seven on scene were um, Meridian Township employees. They were police officers that worked for Meridian Township. Uh, I received the call. I can tell you where I was at. I was on Marsh Road northbound at Lake Lansing when I heard that call go out. And uh, several other officers responded to the station. Um, there were 20 in all that responded in some way, shape, or form. Four of our tactical team members were there. Um, we had officers first on scene at the Union. Also, we had them at, at Berkey Hall. Um, one of our officers assisted in evacuating the victim from the Union and trying to get them to medical attention. Um, I know that Chief Hamill um, had several folks on scene. I'll let him speak to, to their response. Yeah, Madam Supervisor and Board, thank you. Um, yeah, so. I was ironically at a meeting um, as well uh, in Allenton Township, and uh, Chief Campbell tried to call me right after the page came out. Uh, I texted him, I'll call you in five, and then I looked at my active 911 and saw a shooting, of which I jumped up and went out and called him, and he explained to me what happened. So uh, my first instinct was to call my daughter, because she goes to school there, and she was good. Um, our entire shift responded with the exception of one rig. Uh, so we had three ambulances in our truck and, and Battalion Chief Campbell. Um, we ended up uh, with his uh, staff, uh, a couple of our staff, um, interior, uh, extracting the victims, and we transported three to Sparrow. So uh, after that, um, Chief Campbell and myself and uh, Battalion Chief Kuhnter from um, East Lansing went to the command post and helped set up Unified Command. At that point, we just spent a lot of time trying to figure out our needs, our resources, and we ended up actually getting um, an additional 27 ambulances from um, Washtenaw County and Oakland County, uh, just because we didn't know what was gonna happen next. You know, it took three hours to find the, the individual. Um, so uh, if you were listening to the scanner, there were Shots fired every two seconds, it seemed like. And so we were really worried about um, not having enough ambulances. And we had 18 of our own in the metro area that were there um, and from a couple counties. So um, so really, uh, Unified Command was one thing that we, we learned from the Okemos response. And uh, uh, with uh, Chief Paga doing his after action that day, I, I believe it really helped um, us uh, cultivate a good response and teamwork um, from, I don't know how many hundreds of police officers were there? Close to 500. Very hard to manage that, almost impossible. Um, I can't tell you how many firefighters ultimately we had there, but it was a lot. So, um, it, Best case scenario, uh, we uh, we responded right away, and I believe every patient that was transported to Sparrow was there. Call came in 820, they were there uh, probably by 845, 850 at the latest. So um, we ended up having a lot of people come in on recall and, and basically respond to the rest of the township. And uh, um, Nisa came in and actually put an ambulance in the township to help us with that. And so we didn't miss any other calls because we had we had a couple bad accidents um, and some other things. So we were able to maintain that. So uh, ultimately, I think um, with what they did, um, what police did, uh, what fire did, uh, it was it was a it was a well organized um, outing. Not what we wanted. Not what we like. Um, we're going to learn from it and continue on. And you know, we just pray for all the families. So. <laughs> Questions? 
Um, board members, you have questions or comments you'd like to make at this time? Well, just let me say thank you all very much mm -hmm. for um, doing your jobs and the way you do your jobs. Thank you. And thank you for reporting to us. Um, item B on um, uh, 6B is the introduction of two new full-time EMT firefighters, mm -hmm. Chief Hamill. All right. So um, Andrew's the only one that was able to make it tonight. Zachary uh, Silver was not uh, able to make it. He had something come up. Um, I'll just talk about Zachary real quick, and then we'll talk about Andrew, and he can. I forgot to explain the process. <laughs> occupied. So um, let's see. Zachary uh, comes to us from um, the Brighton area. He worked for Brighton Fire Department. We hired him as an EMT um, firefighter. And since uh, hiring him, he actually has already passed his National Registry EMT paramedic written test and practical. Uh, he just passed his practical, I think, Friday. So we're excited now to get him going as a paramedic and, and uh, move on to that. Um, he uh, actually worked in Brighton and Livingston County, and he comes with a tremendous amount of experience, and we're really excited to have him. Um, so I'll try to figure out how to get him to meet you guys at another time. Okay. And then there's Andrew. <laughs> Same thing. Andrew, we hired as an EMT uh, firefighter. Uh, he has since passed his written test, and he takes his practical this week, right? This Friday. This Friday. And so we'll keep our fingers crossed, and then we'll move up, him up to a paramedic. He's from Battle Creek. Uh, he took his paramedic pro program at Kel uh, Kellogg Community College and uh, has, a, again, a tremendous amount of experience. Worked for the Veterans Affairs Fire Department. And... Um, has a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience, and we're just really, really happy to have uh, Andrew and Zach join our team. And uh, we've been lucky to find some really good people without any any long-term vacancies, and it's really just helped a lot. So um, I'll let you say thank you. Go to each person. Pardon me? Just go to each person. Say your thank oh, you. Oh. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Uh, kind of winging this right now because... <laughs> It kind of shows me in the spotlight, but uh, thanks, guys. Looking forward to working with you guys and being part of the Meridian Township community. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. 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 Thank you all, gentlemen. Item 6C on our agenda is the a review or update on the MSU to Lake Lansing Trail presented by um, Deputy Manager Opsimer. Good evening, Supervisor Jackson and board members. Uh, pleased to be before you this evening to give you an update on the MSU to Lake Lansing Trail. Uh, specifically tonight, we're going to be talking about the construction of phases one and two. So after many years of hard work to acquire the land, the necessary funding, including uh, federal funding, county uh, parks and trail millage funding, as well as our local match funding, um, and to design the trail to uh, put it out to bid, I am happy to announce the construction phases for one and two. Uh, phases one and two are uh, projected to be completed by the end of the year. Uh, users will, have, will then have a safe and enjoyable option for non-motorized travel from MSU's campus to Lake Lansing Park South. Uh, phase three, at, uh, which will be constructed at a future year, will then provide non-motorized options for traveling to Lake Lansing Park North. So at the conclusion of this year, we hope that everyone will be able to actually uh, navigate from the MSU campus to Lake Lansing South. And so this is a color-coded map. The blue lines that you see are is uh, phase one. So this is the phase one route right here. Here's MSU campus. Here's Hagedorn Road. Here is uh, Grand River Avenue. And so phase one begins, and there's an RRFB, one of those flashing beacons like we have on Kinawa uh, and several other places in the township, the inner urban crossing on Okemos Road. We've already installed the flashing beacon right there at Shaw and Hagedorn. 
And uh, phase one will take you over the Red Cedar, along the banks of the Red Cedar, along the CN Railroad track to the Park Lake Grand River intersection. The yellow phases of this map are the existing constructed uh, pathways and trails. Phase two is here in green. It's a little bit more difficult to see uh, that line on this map, but I do have some zoomed in slides later on. And then of course we have the existing interurban and the existing phase 2B, which was constructed in 2021. And Lake Lansing Park South is up here. So that uh, yellow, green, and blue route is essentially the route that non or that uh, non-motorized uh, pedestrians and bicyclists will be able to take at the conclusion of 23. So some facts on phase one, uh, it is approximately one mile long. And again, it starts at Hagedorn and Shaw and it concludes at Grand River and Park Lake. It, inclu it includes the pedestrian bridge, which will very closely resemble the pedestrian bridge on Okemos Road, adjacent to the new Camelback Bridge that is being constructed. Um, and again, this trail will take users um, over the Red Cedar behind the MSU Community Music School, and then along the banks of the Red Cedar and the CN Railroad tracks. So here's a zoomed in portion of the phase one uh, trail. One question that I often get is how do you get from phase one to phase two? There's actually two options. The first option is to cross Hagedorn or Grand River Avenue using the signalized intersection here and then take the existing pathway on the north side of Grand River Avenue to phase two. Or you can just proceed right here and then right here at Campus Hill Drive and Grand River Avenue is where the new pedestrian island will be installed as part of uh, the, M or, sorry, the Grand River Avenue project this year. And actually, if you're familiar with Campus Hill Drive, it's a boulevarded drive. The Eastern Drive will be, the existing Eastern Drive will be the trailhead right there. So we will reconfigure that curb and you'll actually be traveling up the existing uh, Eastern Asphalt Driveway there. Photo of phase one construction. You can see the riverbank right here to your right. Another photo of phase one construction. So construction began in December um, and we hope that phase one construction will conclude in July to September, or sorry, July to September of this year. The estimated cost is 3.37 million. We did obtain a $1.7 million federal TAP grant for phase one. The remaining portion of the project will be funded by the Ingham County Trails and Parks Millage and the Township Pathway Millage as the matching funds for the county funds. And again, construction schedule, uh, anticipated completion September, July to September of this year. Phase two. So phase two is slightly longer, 1.2 miles. Uh, no pedestrian bridge, uh, far fewer uh, boardwalks, so the construction is easier. We just received the bids on phase two uh, and are working to schedule the pre-construction meeting. And again, this will take uh, motorists from Campus Hill Drive, essentially to Gaylord C. Smith Court, where our service center is located, and Okemos Road, at which point there will be another RRFB or flashing beacon for that crossing on Okemos Road. So here's a zoomed in uh, portion of the phase two. You can see that it's predominantly being constructed on uh, DTN's Campus Hill property and then the Meridian Uplands, so land, land preservation property. So for this phase, we uh, had minimal land acquisition compared to phase one. Uh, funding of phase two, so phase two, not including phase two B costs, but just phase two will cost approximately 382,000 to construct and this is being funded by the Ingham County Trails and Parks Millage and then our matching grant. And again, construction schedule for this, we are looking at uh, the end of 2023. We're hoping maybe November, early December, this will be wrapped up. And so this is one of the photos of uh, a portion of the trail route for phase two through our land preservation property. So uh, phase 2B, if you recall, this was the widening of the existing pathway on the east side of Okemos Road 
from where phase two will connect at Gaylord C. Smith Court up to the existing interurban trail. And so we widened this to a 10 foot wide pathway in 2021. There's a zoomed in portion of the phase 2B portion of the project right here. Here's a picture of the construction in 2021. There is a picture I took this morning of the completed project. Then the interurban trail, uh, users will then make a right hand turn onto the interurban and take this portion as 1.1 miles and that will take you to Marsh Road, um, just south of Hazlitt Road. Picture of the interurban trail. And so again, in, at the end of 2023, users can use the existing pathway system and the signalized intersection at Hazlitt and Marsh to make that connection to the final phase that we'll talk about, which is the Shaw Street connector. <laughs> This was also constructed in 2021 as part of the drain project and reconstruction of all the roads. So we did install and, and widen uh, the existing sidewalk on Shaw Street. And so we have the 10 foot wide pathway that brings uh, non-motorized users up to the Lake Lansing Park South entrance. There is a photo of the Shaw Street connector. So you can see in Portions of the, of the Shaw Street connector, we were simply widening uh, the system and other portions we were constructing the entire portion of the sidewalk. And there is a zoomed in portion of the Shaw Street connector phase, again, constructed in 2021. Phase three, uh, the township also recently announced that we will begin working on the design and engineering in phase of phase three in 2023. We would hope to complete that design and engineering sometime in 2024 and put the project out to bid, hopefully for construction in 2025. And there is a zoomed in portion of the phase three route. So it ends essentially in the northeast corner of the township uh, near where the CN railroad tracks uh, cross Green Road. So, and once we have completed uh, all three phases of the remaining portions of the trail, uh, users will then have um, approximately 6.7 miles of trail system that they can enjoy as part of the MSU to Lake Lansing Trail. Happy to answer any questions that you have this evening. Um, Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. Uh, so the Phase, the end of the phase three um, trail you said was uh, located at the crossing of, or relatively close to the crossing of Green and um, the CN track. Um, what is the, I mean, is that going to be like a trail head? What's the, what would that look like exactly? So we haven't, we haven't designed uh, this trail, so we're not specifically certain, but the reason to take the trail this far north eastwardly is because the uh, county will be putting in a new trail roughly about right here. It's shown on our pathway master plan. If you pull up our pathway master plan on the website, so you'll be able to take a trail off of phase three and into the existing trails that comprise Lake Lansing Park North. Uh, one trouble, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget exactly why it was, but uh, Bicycles are not allowed in the Lake Lansing Park North trail system, and that had to do with the land acquisition. So uh, that land was acquired from the adjacent neighborhood, um, and as part of it, I believe there was a deed restriction or a restricted covenant or some other instrument uh, that required that it be uh, pedestrian-only trails in the park system. So that is the one caveat, so we're aware of that. We may do like uh, bicycle parking at that trailhead uh, so that people have a place to put their bike. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Deshane. Just to reiterate, so by the end of 2023, we will have our MSU to Lake Lansing bike path finished. Not the entirety of it. Phase three, this orange portion will yes. not be finished. 
but you will be able to take the trail route from Lake Lansing Park South using the yellow, green, and blue sections here. Blue and green are what we are constructing this year. Phase three is kind of a surprise to me. I was expecting just um, to see the it, to dead end at Lake Lansing uh, Park South. And so um, the extra up to green road is an, and add on to it. But it's really great news that we're going to have this path done by the end of this year with the extension done next year. Yeah, there's a lack of public knowledge about the project. <laughs> and so we've made a concerted effort. We uh, recently put this together in early February and issued a press release to really try to give residents a detailed overview and look at what the experience would be. We also, uh, thanks to our communications manager, uh, Sam Deal, we have drone footage of the phase one trail route. And so we're still going through and reviewing that, but we'll be releasing some fun social media content with that phase one route. And then of course, after construction, we will get um, footage of the same trail route post construction. So we can do a side by side, a before and after. Um, we can do a lot of fun things with that imagery. And we'll be doing drone footage of phase two as well. And based on the popularity of the inner ribbon, there's no reason to believe this won't be wildly popular with our residents. I met with uh, President Stanley before he departed MSU, and he was very excited about this trail. There's going to be a ton of excitement about this. So we're certainly going to work on increasing awareness and understanding of the trail system. Like I said, the number one question I get is right here. How do you get from Grand River and Park Lake to Campus Hill and Grand River? Um, that's been the big dot that people really need connected. The other thing to keep in mind, the um, I almost put a photo of one of these signs in there, but when you see the big dark blue signs, the wayfinding signs for trails, that is a county project. So the county holds a contract with Spicer Group for those signs, but we will have signs installed post-construction. But that's something that we have to work on with the county. Okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. 6D is an update on the Township Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program. Um, Director Titoff. Good evening, Madam Supervisor and Board. It's great to see everybody. I'm glad that we could be together. I am going to just give you a quick overview of what's happening in DEI here at the Township. Uh, we had our task force met in January. Uh, we have been hashing out our plan, which is intended to be a framework that all of the township uses to make sure that we are doing right by all of our staff and in how we serve our community. Uh, our mission statement remains, as uh, Trustee Wazinski, I think, helped us come up with uh, in 2021, which is to promote and support a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce through training, evaluation, and action. So with that, we have developed purpose and guiding principles. Uh, we were intending to have another meeting, um, but then things have been as you know, pretty tumultuous. So we're still working out the specific details of the actual plan itself, but we do have the framework. And the good news about that is that we are working it out so that we have a way to assess ourselves. We establish our quarterly um, training for staff and leadership, and it also will affect how we relate to our community. It all works together. We are a village. Um, some of the guiding principles that we talked about in our January meeting were inclusivity, diversity, equity, collaboration, reflection, and data-driven decision-making. And I think we did talk about it previously about working with the, um, the SMART process where we have something specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. So we work with that in mind in every meeting. So together we have come up, we have our, uh, for 2023, as you already know, we have our Celebrate Meridian. We have that coming up in June. We have our Juneteenth celebration for the weekend of the 16th. And we will have some internal and external celebrations that tie to that event. And as you also know, uh, thank you board, uh, you have approved our Juneteenth as a, a holiday that we are able to observe as a, a employees. And then, Last but not least, we are having our first Pride celebration. 
And we are looking at that for August of this year. We've got our planning committee and we are looking forward to having another, I think this will be our second meeting on Friday. So that'll be a stellar step in a positive direction. We're really looking forward to it. Uh, so with our DEI plan overview, um, we're still working on the specifics of the framework, but as you know, we have the intention of follow through with our quarterly meetings, our quarterly trainings for our staff. And the intent really behind all of it is to continue to promote our connection. So I'm incredibly grateful. We are so fortunate and I have a unique, a unique viewpoint from being in human resources because I work with all of our departments. So I get to see everybody in their work, in their zone, doing amazing things. And the positive impact is perpetual. And it's amazing to be part of. So what we are still working on, and we do every year, is just a part of who we are. We celebrate our people, our staff, for their strengths. We have employee events. We will continue to do that. And Frank, Manager Walsh, has been stellar in, in leading those. He, it's absolutely a part of his wiring that it must happen, that we celebrate our staff and appreciate them uh, through employee events, just to de-stress and have fun. And I don't know if you've heard about the holiday party, but we had a pretty serious competition <laughs> with uh, some uh, trivia, and people were really really into it and it was it's just a, a lovely way to just change the channel for a minute and just connect as people so we have our employee events um, annual picnic uh, other employee appreciation events luncheons you know just impromptu lunches when we can when the weather is marvelous I mean who knows what this week holds um, and then our holiday party and we work on township gear too I think that staff seem to appreciate that I see quite a bit of it around um, focusing on well-being and health. Um, I think our staff know, and we've been trying to communicate it, and I always have stuff in HR, but we have uh, an employee assistance program that really, um, it was a, a great opportunity to provide support to the people who support our community. So we did um, a special type of um, uh, critical incident debriefing for all of our first responders and we we got to that as quickly as we could in the moment so my understanding is that those went well um, for policy and procedures we are working through all language in all of our township documents we've got um, we just finished four of our contracts last year went through all of the contracts and read them word for word and replaced anything that's got something gender specific with something gender non-specific just so that we're starting to be more mindful of who is reading our documents and who is part of those documents um, and that will apply across the board contracts personnel training policies anything anything at all so that will have a, a DEI lens um, I think some of the other things, uh, we have our ADA process that we put in for meetings uh, to make sure that we're doing right by the folks who need to participate in a different way while still adhering to the um, Open Meetings Act. And then we have our sanitary product dispensers that were put in. Um, and I think that's going very well. We've had lots of positive feedback and folks who do appreciate and use said products. And that's kind of the overview, really. It's just the connectedness and making sure that we're checking in with ourselves and making sure that we plan ahead and we have things measurable that we can talk with you about. So if you have questions, let me know. Questions, comments? Thank you. Abby? And our final presentation is, um, the is 6E, the 2022 Meridian Township Annual Report. Mr. Walsh, Manager Walsh. Thank you, I appreciate that. And before I give a very brief summary, and I mean very brief, um, I just got contacted by Dr. Lilly, uh, Janet Lilly, who's Vice President of Governmental Affairs at Michigan State. I'm sure most of you know Dr. Lilly, but um, on behalf of the university, she expressed her um, deep appreciation for uh, the very moving um, way you started the meeting. So I want to pass that along to the board. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to be very brief tonight because this started um, 
15 months ago <laughs> when the board started planning 2022 in uh, November, December of 21. Plan 22, as you know, we accomplished uh, as a team, accomplished a lot in 22. It's um, clearly delineated in this uh, um, 2022 annual report. Um, it's been out for a couple of weeks now. Um, it's available um, on our website. It's available at the libraries. And we also covered it um, in front of our board and commissioner uh, meeting uh, that we had in this room uh, last month. So we presented it to the public. I just want to remind everyone that it is available. I don't plan to go through any of it tonight because we've done that and it's available for anyone who wishes to take a look at it. But thank you for all your work and especially for um, honoring um, our neighbors and friends at the university. Thank you. Thank you. We come to item seven, where we have citizens address agenda items and non-agenda items. I have two um, green cards here tonight. The first is from Rex Harrington. You will give us your name and address. Rx Harrington, 820 Piper Road, Hazlitt. And I've come to uh, comment on the uh, presentation you had two sessions ago by a man who uh, was talking about the Red Cedar River, how the Red Cedar River was clogged with log jams, and that if these were cleared away, that it would be a, a very fine uh, recreational asset for the township. And this runs right through the middle of, ta of Meridian Township, and it is unusable. So I'd like to support that notion. And there were two questions from the board, and I'd like to answer them. The first question was, whether the log jams would reform if they were taken away at this time, why wouldn't they reform when new trees fell into the water or washed into the water? And uh, the answer to that question, I believe, and this is a, 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 uh, is a theory more than it is an experience, is that uh, I, I did canoe that trip from, uh, from um, Meridian Road and Grand River down to Okemos Road. And so I saw and went through all the, the log jams and it was a, just about like a, a session of survivor to get through them. But at the bottom of each of those log jams, there seems to be an anchor log or something deeply buried in the sand. And that's probably been there for decades. And this log doesn't move when the, when the storms come through and, and, it, and the other logs pile up against it. <clears throat> so my thought was that instead of just removing the upper logs, you have to pull out these anchor logs. And to pull those anchor logs out is not something I know how to, that it's been done or how it's done. But there's probably a, a machine to do it. Obviously you can't use ground-based or tire-based machinery because it's all in the wilderness. So you have to bring something in either on a barge or you'll have to invent something. But these, these anchor logs, when they're pulled up, I think that we can manage the, the, the uh, logs that uh, wash into the river after that with just a standard crew, you know, chainsaw and float them out. So that would be the first thing I would say. The second question was about the cost. And that cost would depend a lot on how these anchor logs are pulled up. But my feeling is, is that the rivers are assets of Michigan. And as that there are the assets of Michigan, then it's the responsibility of the government of Michigan, the state government, to handle this project. And so I would encourage the board to write letters to our representative Julie Brixey, our, rep <laughs> our, our rep representative Penelope Ternaglu, and Senator Sam Singh. So why not write that letter and uh, we'll have that uh, project done. <laughs> Thank, you for that. Thank you for that advice, Mr. Harrington. <laughs> Our second green card is from um, Representative Julie Brixey, a, a longtime friend of this board, and um, maybe she'll give us some insight on Mr. Harrington's suggestion. <laughs> Um, I, I didn't. I didn't come here to talk about uh, log jams. <laughs> I, um, 
Like Chief Plaga, last week I was at the Okemos School Board meeting attending the debriefing that the police department and the other agencies gave um, from their response to the swatting episode uh, that had occurred. And um, I was updating uh, the school board on legislation that we had introduced uh, the week before uh, regarding the school safety uh, package that um, we had worked on um, last year in the wake of the Oxford shootings. Um, like Chief Plaga, I uh, left that meeting and found myself not long afterwards um, going over and I spent the evening with the East Lansing Police Department. Um, and you know, while our community has been reeling and grieving from the loss of the three um, wonderful people and the tragedy um, of the five others who are still um, hospitalized, the thousands of students and staff members who were traumatized by the events, um, you know, while, while we've been grieving that, I do wanna take a moment to echo the thank you that the board has passed along uh, to the first responders. We had the opportunity um, last week to thank some of them on the House floor, uh, but having been on the Township Board for 18 years before going to the legislature and working uh, hand in hand with both the police and fire departments, you know, I fully understand the impacts that these types of events have on our people. We expect the first responders to go in there and do their jobs and put their lives in danger, which they did. Um, but we should also recognize that they're human beings. Many of them are parents and um, the aftermath can't be easy uh, for any of them. So, um, Again, thank you, both of you chiefs, and please pass that along to um, all of your folks. I know it, it's, it's been tough on everybody. Um, so t today, I am not wearing green, um, I'm wearing red. And our clerk is a member of Moms Demand Action and has come and visited me in office hours multiple times. Uh, and so I thought uh, for her sake, and because of the uh, resolution that you have tonight that you were um, going to be voting on, uh, I thought I would wear red in honor of um, mom's demand. I too am a mom and uh, several of my kids attended MSU. So the school safety task force update I have is that we introduced about a 12 bill package a week ago Friday um, and it kind of streamlines and makes uniform what schools should be doing with their, um, with their active shooter drills. And the purpose of this is so that all of the um, police departments and first responders throughout the state, they all have kind of a similar um, methodology in response because, you know, as we saw um, last week and the week before, multiple jurisdictions participate um, in these types of events. So there were a number of bills uh, speaking to the uniformity uh, of those types of um, plans and drills. They also um, address some standardizing definitions that are important for the school board. Um, you know, definitions of school safety terms and uh, definitions behind the OK to Say program uh, that the schools are using. Uh, and the bills also uh, give guidance and specifics to timelines and handling of reports that come in uh, from kids or from members of the public about uh, potential threats. Um, in addition to the school safety package, last week the Senate introduced an 11 bill package um, that, and the House will be introducing it tomorrow. Um, and that uh, includes 
several bills on universal background checks, um, a number of bills on extreme risk protection orders, which are sometimes called red flag laws. And um, those laws allow weapons to be removed from someone's home if they are a threat to themselves or to other people. Uh, I think it's important for folks to remember that 60% of deaths from firearms are by suicide. And these extreme risk protection orders um, have the ability to really uh, make a measurable impact on reducing some, some of those um, numbers. The third uh, bucket of bills is safe, safe storage laws. And um, there's, I think, three different bills in that package that um, make specifics. In addition to those, those packages that the Senate introduced and will be introducing in the House, and we will be having joint hearings starting Thursday, joint Senate and House hearings for these um, reform bills. Uh, in addition to that, um, I'm, I'm also introducing a bill package that would ban guns from the Capitol building and the grounds, as well as um, the state office buildings uh, that are um, around. And, you know, one of the reasons for that that we've heard from so many people is that the Capitol is the people's house. And we receive a lot of visitors every year at the Capitol, about a million visitors, and the vast majority of them are children. Uh, so this is something that uh, we have been receiving a lot of calls about over the entire time I've been in the legislature to make it safer for our children and that you know, one of our duties as elected officials is to look out for people and protect the health, safety, and welfare of folks. And children are people that definitely uh, need and deserve protecting. So that is my update for you um, on those bills. And I, again, appreciate your advocacy uh, and look forward to um, perhaps coming back and give you, giving you an update on um, what we pass. And if anyone had any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Are there questions you'd like to ask at this time? Not, not just yet, Judy. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Yes. We now come to um, item eight on our agenda, which is the township manager's report. Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you, Madam Supervisor and Board. Again, I'll be brief. Um, I know you've got a lot of um, issues ahead of you tonight. Uh, I just want to talk about one item, and that's the renovation of this building and start getting that information, continue to get that information out to the public um, because we're only here to serve. And mm -hmm. in order to um, serve the public in, a, in the best way we can, people need to know what's what's happening. I want to uh, take you back to 2014, February. I think it was around the 13th where we um, closed the central fire station on Clinton Street. And we closed it because of the poor condition it was in. Um, the, the the firefighters should have been out of there 10 years before that. Uh, it was in very, very poor condition. I believe the clerk's uh, aunt and uncle live right across the street from there. So we closed that building um, back then to, um, and we made a makeshift station, which was better off than where, the, where our firefighters and paramedics were before. And so that decision, fast forward to now, we're trying to protect our assets and invest in our buildings. And if you walk around this building, most of this building is 50 years old. Actually, this is the only part of the building that's been renovated. So when you look around this, in this room, you think, well, this building's pretty nice. But you should take a walk around the building and see the wallpaper that's coming off and the carpet and the equipment of <clears throat> the office furniture is from the 70s. So it's time to reinvest in our building. We've been setting aside, as you know, cash for a number of years to do this we're prepared to do it this year so we're, it looks like we're going to begin uh, in mid-april uh, moving out of this building uh, this room here the town hall room will remain open throughout the course of the renovation it will remain open so citizens who come here to be served 
um, by this building, or had in this building, will continue to be served. Um, we'll access through this door over here, and in here will be the entire um, treasurer's office, so we'll be able to still um, take um, bills just like we take bills now. Um, people will be able to pay their invoices, get information. But in addition to that, we'll have four other departments in here with one person each, and that would be assessing and building and um, 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 planning and engineering, and we'll spread those uh, folks out in here as best we can. Uh, we'll still be able to have our meetings in here best we can, <clears throat> but this will start about mid-April and go till October 1st. Uh, the rest of the building will be spread out. The rest of the staff, 53 of us, will be spread out into three different buildings, and that'll be down. Uh, one, we'll put 19 people down at the 242, next to the 242 Church uh, building on Bennett Road near the um, uh, Bennett Woods Elementary. Uh, we'll be moving some departments down there. I won't go through them all tonight because we'll be communicating this to the public. And then we'll be putting 12 of our um, team members over across uh, the street in the um, in the police department. And then another um, 9 or 10 over at the service center. Three of our members will stay in the building and they'll work out of the studio, the communications department, because they have an ingress, egress that doesn't take them through the building. We're going to try that. So that's where the 53 people, 53 team members will be relocated uh, April 17th to about October 1st. Um, it'll be a replacement, um, uh, it'll be a painting uh, of the walls, it'll be new carpeting, and new office furniture. Those are the only three components we're looking at. There will be areas of the building, such as the restrooms and other um, areas that we don't uh, get to with this remodeling, but we're staying within budget, we're paying cash for it, and we're taking care of a building that's been um, basically in this condition for 50 years. The only part that's newer is the far um, south end of the building in the communications wing, which was built, I believe, in 90 or 92. So I just wanted to start getting this out there. This project is coming forward and we'll be vacating this building from April 17th roughly um, until October 1st. And much more information on this and we will be sending a letter directly to um, our residents letting them know. But the most important thing is this room will remain open and we'll be able to serve most everyone that comes in and of me in, in this room right here. So thank you. I know there will be there will be lots of opportunities for questions and information. I know this is not new news to you, but I want to start getting this information out to the public. So thank you very much, and good luck with your uh, issues the rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Item nine is board member reports of activities and announcements. Treasurer DeShane. Thank you. I'll also be quick today. On February 10th, I attended the MABA meeting um, at the invitation of Director Clark, who had several members of the M team there to talk to the Meridian Area Business Association. It was a very good meeting. We got to tell them about all the things we do here in Meridian Township, many of them helpful to our local businesses. Uh, February 14th was the Senior Community Center Task Force meeting, which met for the first time, and it was a good a good first meeting. We're in the process of collecting data. Um, We'll be doing some very likely be doing some site visits of other senior and community centers throughout the state. And the 15th was the CATA board meeting, uh, and I attended with our newest Meridian Township board member, Phyllis Vaughn, who we appointed at the last meeting and was sworn in in time to attend her first meeting. Taxes were due on February 14th, and we could go today. Um, and I'm happy to report 97% plus of all of our residents paid on time. That's where the 3% who haven't yet paid, well, one is down to 2% today, a week later. <laughs> but they've got another, um, they have until the 28th, a week from today, to pay their taxes here to, at the township. As of March 1st, they'll need to go to the Ingham County Treasury to pay your, their taxes. That's, that's state law. So I encourage people to come in and pay that balance off before it goes to the county treasurer because there are additional fines and penalties added on to it when it goes to the county treasurer. That's my report. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Trustee Wilson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I attended the, uh, com the CRC, the Community Resource Commission meeting on February 8th. Um, there was discussion about spreading the word more thoroughly throughout the community about the aspects of Meridian Cares, which is our program that assists low-income individuals or people in an emergency with rent, utilities, and bus passes. So. That was a productive meeting. I also attended the um, task force uh, looking at the possibility of building a community and senior center in this community. We had our very first meeting. Um, I was there with 
Supervisor Jackson and Trustee, um, I'm sorry, Treasurer DeShane, who is part of the group. And uh, we had a projected discussion just talking about the visioning of what this could look like in our community. So I'll be chairing that in the future, this uh, particular task force. And I'm really excited to see what we can bring forward to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Then we'll move on to um, approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Trustee Wazinski. Move to approve the agenda as presented. Support. Supported by Trustee Wilson. All in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 Hold no. And we'll move on now to um, the agenda is approved. We'll move on now to the consent agenda. In the consent agenda, our typical communications minutes of the February 7, 2023 regular township board meeting, bills, and a um, letter, uh, authorization of a letter to the FAA in support of American Airlines at the local airport. Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I move the consent agenda as presented this evening. Support. Um, support, I believe, this time by Mr. DeShane. There are any comments? Um, then we need a roll call vote, Mr. Lamaster, for the Consent agenda. Supervisor Jackson? Yes. Clerk Guthrie? Yes. Treasurer DeShane? Yes. Trustee Hendrickson? Yes. Trustee Sundland? Yes. Trustee Wilson? Yes. Trustee Wazinski? Yes. Motion carried 7 0. Thank you. With no questions for the attorney, we have a public hearing tonight, item 13. A public hearing is on the Hazlitt Village Square Commercial Rehabilitation Exemption application. Director Clark. Good evening, members of the board. Yes, uh, the item before you tonight is the public hearing related to the commercial exemption, the commercial rehabilitation exemption application. So we've received an application from the developers SP holding for 1655, 1621 Hazlitt Road. This is going to mimic everything that we did in um, September of last year. The reason why we did not submit this ERA application was they were not the property owners. So uh, submitting the application to the STC, we've, we've We've called them, we've emailed them over and over and over again. Uh, it is a process, much like other tax exempting, where they're going to exempt for the full year. So as long as we submit our application within uh, 23 before October 31st, the exemption should hit in time for 2021. So it begin January, 20, January 1st, 2024. So the exemption application is going to exempt, uh, a, provide a tax abatement for 10 years beginning um, January, December 31st of this year and ending December 30th, 2033, which is just crazy for me to be thinking about. But yes, so 10 years, we get that exemption. Um, so much of the, uh, the request before the board tonight is exactly the same as what we did in September. The project is the same. The developers are the same. The reason why we did not uh, bring it forward before is because they were not the property owners. Okay. Um, at this time, I think I need to open the public hearing for comments uh, about this, propo this proposal. Are there members of the public who would like to speak either in support or in, in opposition to the proposal described by um, Director Clark? All right, well, seeing none, I guess we can close our <laughs> public hearing and move on. This is on for discussion, so we'll be back. Thank you. Out of 14 are our action items. The first, 
14A is Ordinance 2023-01, which um, is a rezoning of 1642 Lake Court from RB to RCC with a conditional rezoning agreement. And we're here tonight for an introduction. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. Director Schmidt. Um, the request in front of you this evening is, um, again, uh, the request is to rezone the uh, approximately 0.7 acres of land um, between Lake Lansing and Lake Court directly to the west of the old CZD's building there at Marsh Road uh, from the current zoning of RB, One Family High Density Residential, and C1, Neighborhood Service. The property is currently split zone to RCC, multifamily re multiple family residential zoning, with a condition of that rezoning limiting the development to 12 dwelling units or six duplexes. Uh, the Planning Commission did hold a public hearing for this matter earlier this year, had no major, major concerns and, and voted to recommend approval. Uh, the board uh, reviewed this at their last meeting and had no major concerns and directed staff to bring this forward. Uh, this, at this time, staff would recommend approval of the introduction. Uh, if the board chooses to approve this, we will uh, publish the notice as required in a paper of general circulation and bring it back for final action at your next meeting. Thank you. Board members, is there a motion? Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I move to adopt the resolution of today's introduction, Ordinance 2023-01, an ordinance to rezone the property at 1642 Lake Court Drive, parcel ID number 33-0202-10-207-032 from RB, one family, High Density Residential and C1 Neighborhood Service to RCC Multiple Family Residential subject to a condition of rezoning limiting development on the lot to 12 dwelling units. Mr. Henderson, would you like to uh, comment further? Sure. Um, we saw this at our last meeting, I believe, uh, and this will effectively not increase um, the number of dwelling units that were possible on the uh, property, on the parcel. Um, <clears throat> the plan is for a number of duplexes, I believe, as I recall from our last meeting. Um, and I think that this is an excellent opportunity for infill development and uh, to clean up what are some properties that could use some revitalization in the Hazlitt area. Um, and so I wholeheartedly support it. Okay. Trustee Wilson? Agreed, and particularly because we're replacing blight with uh, viable development. So that's the reason I'll be voting for it. All right. Anyone else? Mr. Duchesne. I too will be supporting this. And if they have replaced blight, in fact, the homes are all down of it, down by that parcel. Correct. And so that's like the ones, this approval, I would guess they're going to begin construction this spring. Is that what you understand this spring? They spring? still have, uh, to, they still do need to go through the site plan review process and work with the county train commission and road commission on the necessary approvals. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it's a welcome addition to the, to the Hazlitt portion of our township. Other comments? Well, the, the uh, motion is to adopt the resolution. This is for um, uh, introduction um, for Ordinance 2023-01. This is a rezoning. All in favor of the motion, please say yes. 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 Close no. And motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Item 14B is a resolution to call for legislative action on gun violence prevention. Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I move to suspend our rules to consider item 14B for action at tonight's meeting. Support. Mr. Henderson. Uh, this is something that I think is timely given the events of the last several weeks, um, and I believe that um, it was it is crucial for our community and those in the area to voice their support to the legislature um, who will be taking these bills up in short order. And Trustee Wilson. Yes, I support for the exact same reasons. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Um, the... Um, 
<clears throat> Mr. Um, Henderson, would you like to highlight some of the features of the resolution? I'd be happy to. I, I might be more prudent um, at the motion to approve there than the suspension of the rules. Oh, Just must move to. So um, we're actually acting on the motion to suspend. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. This can be done by voice vote, I believe. All in favor of the motion to suspend our rules to consider this um, resolution, please say yes. Yes. Opposed yes. no. The motion carries um, unanimously. And now, Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. <laughs> I move to approve the attached resolution, 14B, calling on the Michigan Legislature and Congress to action on gun violence prevention legislation. Support. Supported by Trustee Wilson. Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. Uh, I, I bring this resolution before us tonight um, with Trustee Wazinski and yourself as co-sponsors. Um, however, I suspect that if it were possible for us all to sign on, um, that we would we would have. Um, I, I'd ask for some latitude from Clerk Guthrie and her team, um, allowing my statement, which I'll provide, um, be printed in full in the minutes. Um, I, I put a lot of thought into it, and I'm hopeful that um, that it can be at least a little bit meaningful um, to the community. Um, our community's been through hell the last two weeks. Um, two weeks ago, the worst fears of parents, students, and teachers, and administrators um, were all but realized um, at our high school in Okemos. A terrorist, and that's what they are, called in to emergency line to report that there was a gunman at Okemos High School. Um, and that two students had already been shot. Um, and we were incredibly fortunate as a community, incredibly fortunate to discover that this was indeed a hoax um, and that our families uh, were safe and sound. But this did not ex um, stop us <coughs> from experiencing a traumatic event as a community. Trustee Wazinski at our last meeting um, told us of, of her experience as a parent um, the fear that she had, the parent of a high school student at Okemos High School. Um, despite the fact that we emerged physically safe, our community was left with emotional damage that may take years to process fully. Um, at our next meeting the next day, I sat before you and reminded us of how lucky we were um, and mentioned that we may not be so lucky next time. And I've never in my life wanted to be more wrong than it ended up being. Because just six days later, everything that we had feared came to pass. Um, a gunman at our university, just four miles from this building, from where we sit tonight, Ariel Anderson, Alexandria Werner, Brian Frazier, two juniors and a sophomore struck down in their place of learning. Five more critically injured, and as of today, one is stable, Two are in serious but stable condition, and two remain in critical condition, and one of these five is one of Okemos' own. All at the hands of someone with no connection to them, no connection to the university, someone who's been previously charged with gun crimes, someone whose own father barely recognized him after a traumatic loss in the family. I attended Michigan State University, as did my parents before me. I met my wife there, and she went there later on to, attain her, to obtain her master's degree as well. My wife was an MSU employee for a number of years, running camps for gifted and talented youth from across the state and beyond. <clears throat> One of the things that I feared when I started at MSU was how big it was. I sought out comfort in the familiar. Um, I grew up in Troy, Michigan, which is a neighboring community to Clawson, which is where one of the victims was from. And I realized um, that nearly a quarter of my graduating class, over 100 students, would be attending MSU. And I further realized that if that trend had held true, that about 1% of all undergraduate students at MSU were from my high school. It's a boggling statistic to think about. And I did meet people who I knew um, from home, but I was also thrust into meeting scores of new friends who I grew up with graduated with and have stayed friends with to this day. But one of the most compelling parts of the community that Michigan State has created was taught to me on my first day when a senior stood up at an event, 
participation is what they called it back in the day. Um, and let us know that wherever we were, <clears throat> if we were to run into another Spartan, we could always yell out, go green, and invariably, they would respond with go white. At the time, I didn't understand how important that would be. Um, Meridian Township is inextricably linked to Michigan State University. Students live here and work here. Faculty live here and raise their families here. Nearly everyone who comes, uh, nearly everyone who attends MSU at one point comes to Meridian Township, whether it's for our trails, our parks, our events, our shops, or more. If I asked those present here tonight to raise their hand if they could find a direct link to Michigan State University, I think we all know that everyone's hand in this room would be up. But even if we didn't, we're a community who cares for its residents and cares for its neighbors. I'll crib from President Roosevelt when he, quote, when he said about the Lend-Lease Act, when your neighbor's house is on fire, you don't stop to ask him to pay you for the garden hose. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, the fine work of our police, fire, and EMS heroes um, who are here tonight um, and those that aren't here tonight. Um, because when the call came in, our personnel rushed in and were some of the first on the scene, as we heard from Director, from Chief Plaga and Chief Hamill. They deserve to be recognized again for their hard work. So thank you. They didn't hesitate to put themselves into an active situation, one that was fraught with misinformation, but they did their job. This good work should never have been necessary. This was a situation that should have been preventable. And that's why we're here tonight, to start the process of addressing the underlying causes of this incident and to ask our state legislatures and our members of Congress to step up in the wake of this unspeakable and traumatic event and to make changes that are both wildly popular and at the same time common sense. And I appreciate Representative Brixey coming tonight to tell us about the work that they've already started. I do. We'll be asking them in this resolution to take up laws that would require background checks universally before any weapons purchase. These laws would prevent those with histories of violent or irresponsible behavior from obtaining weapons that might be used for violence. We'll ask them to take up red flag laws or extreme risk protection orders so that our courts can, after deliberation and evidence, prevent those who are in imminent danger to themselves or others from owning firearms. We'll ask the legislature to create safe storage laws so that others, including small children, may not gain access to guns. We'll ask for a ban on assault-style weapons prohibiting the sale of semi-automatic and automatic weapons as they are the favorite weapon of those seeking to maximize terror and casualties from these sorts of incidents. And we'll ask for magazine capacity restrictions, which will slow down would-be assailants from being able to fire weapons quickly and repeatedly. As of tonight, the Michigan legislature has already begun their hard work, and we applaud them for their initiative here. They will likely face steep, swift, and well-funded opposition to their efforts, as one group has already came, come out to say that they will recall anyone who votes for gun control legislation. I believe it is our duty and our obligation to stand up and tell them that they have our support um, and that passing this resolution will do just that. I think that, you know, tonight by passing this resolution, we'll be pledging ourselves to a cause, but also to our neighbors and our communities. Uh, we know that there were those in the MSU community who were at Sandy Hook when that event occurred. We know that there were those at MSU who were at Oxford, and we know that there are those who had family members who were both places and who were both in Okemos schools <clears throat> last week and at MSU this week. Um, who have faced or thought they were facing two of these incidents in as many weeks. I've said before when this resolution, a similar resolution came up last May, that my wife was a teacher at a local junior high school. And she still is. Um, and she goes to school every day. And in addition to planning lessons, grading homework, and proctoring tests, she has to consider what she would do if her school was next. She has to decide whether her class should be running, hiding, or fighting in the face of an active violent, active incident. 
<clears throat> she has to be counselor to grieving students who are terrified by what happened last week and dozens more who are worried that they'll be next. And I worry about her safety. I worry about what would happen if I got the call one day. Too often. My children are young. My oldest will be starting kindergarten in Alchemist in the fall. And we've been pretty good about shielding him from what's been going on. But next year, someday, rather than learning about sharing or reading or writing or all the things that a child of five should be learning, his teacher will have to explain about hiding behind their desks, barricading their doors, and staying silent. No student, staff, parent, no one should have to worry about their loved one being shot in school. Schools are meant to be temples of knowledge, not war-torn regions where they face death on a daily basis. They should not be. This ordeal has forced me to reflect a lot over the last few days. And I keep coming back to that first day on campus when they explained what Go Green meant. <clears throat> they were exp explaining a call and response. When someone responds with go white, they are responding to you. They're telling you that you're not alone. They are, without saying anything else, telling you that they share so many iconic Spartan experiences. They're telling you that they're a member of your community and of your family. And I like to think that they're telling you that they are here for you. That's certainly how I view it now. And so, I ask my colleagues to please support this resolution tonight. And go green. Go oh, oh, green. Right. Other, other members of the board? Um, Courtney? There's. Trustee Wazinski. Hey. Thank you, Trustee Hendrickson. That was very thoughtful, um, very moving, very touching. Not too much I can add to that that you haven't already said but I 100% support this and I'll do whatever we can to help the legislature. Others? Then to um, <clears throat> pass the resolution, to approve the attached resolution, um, calling, the, the, calling on the Michigan legislature and Congress to act on gun violence prevention legislation. Could we have a roll call vote, Mr. LeMaster? Yes. Clerk Guthrie? Yes. Treasurer DeShane? Yes. Trustee Hendrickson? Yes. Trustee Sundland? Yes. Trustee Wilson? Yes. Trustee Wazinski? Yes. Motion carried 7-0. Thank you, thank, and thank you, Mr. Um, Hendrickson. Thank you. We move now to item 14C, um, and Manager Walsh will introduce the next few items. Thank you. Um, again, this issue has been um, before you on uh, now, this is the fourth occasion. Um, it's something that we've been working on with our fire and police unions. We have um, three unions involved. We have the Firefighters Union, Police Patrol, and uh, Police Command. Going back um, three years ago, we negotiated a five-year agreement with those three bargaining group, uh, groups. And it was a two-year, 2% 2 increase per year for five years. And so we are in the fourth year. January 1 of 23 started the fourth year of that agreement. And that agreement then expires, terminates on December 31 of 2024. So we have approximately uh, 21 months remaining on that contract. Well, we uh, negotiated this contract. The terms seemed pretty fair back at the time, 2% per year. Um, today, that does seem, it doesn't seem like it matches um, 
the economy doesn't match in, um, what people with inflation and, and all of that. So we've been talking to our unions regularly uh, in the last uh, two, two and a half months and letting them know that we're putting together um, a proposal to bring to them. What we've offered all three unions mirrors exactly what we provided to all of our other team members. So there, when we're talking about the unions, we're talking about 30, roughly 34 in the firefighter paramedic and roughly 38 in the, in the police department, although the police department is sworn at 41. That's broken up between the command and patrol. So what's before you tonight is uh, mirrors exactly what we uh, what was approved for other unions, and that is a three percent increase and an additional one time five percent increase for those that are at the top of their step or those that don't have a step process. Uh, police police union, police patrol, and fire union have a step process, which is now four steps. It used to be six, but other positions um, are at a salary level and they have no steps to them. And those folks would receive the three percent and the five percent one-time adjustment. So what we've offered to all three of these next uh, agenda items is that three and five percent. It would take effect with the uh, immediately with the next payroll if it's approved by the board tonight. I will share with you that um, the fire fire union under um, uh, C, they've not finished their process. They have a 72-hour window of bargaining or with um, voting on a, a contract extension. So what we've provided or what we've requested is a four-year agreement. So if this is approved by the unions, um, and I want them to take their time in doing it, it would... Um, our contract that was set to expire on December 31 of 24 would now expire December 31 of 2026. So it would be a, a basically an 8% increase in 23, and then 3, 3, and 3 would be the new contract. So again, that mirrors other uh, unions. Uh, we're waiting on the firefighter. I talked to uh, TJ Booms uh, just a little while ago. Um, they're having a meeting tonight to explain the contract offer, and they'll begin a 72-hour voting process, which um, would um, end probably Saturday morning. We would know where they're at. And this then, if this happens, this item would be in front of you um, if it's approved, uh, ratified by the fire union. It would be before you on March 7th. So that's an update on the fire uh, union prospect. And I appreciate uh, President T.J. Booms contacting me earlier uh, this evening and letting me know where they're at in the process. We've had some good discussions with them. Uh, moving on to D, I won't belabor the point. It's the same thing what we offered. Um, the Police Officers Association, which would be the police, police patrol, they have um, approved, they've had their vote, they've approved it, so it's before you tonight um, for um, your consideration. And it's everything I just said, it about a four-year term, the contract, and all of that. Okay. Board members. Um, we are considering item 14D. Mr. DeShane. Just clarification, so because we haven't heard back from the firefighters, 14C would have to be put off until we've heard back from the union. Is that correct? That's what I would recommend. Okay. I would recommend not voting on it until it's ratified by the union. Okay. I'd like to thank you for bringing this before the board and being proactive about this. The firefighters uh, and the police officers are experiencing the same inflation that we are, the same cost of living increasing, yeah. increasing costs, costs across the board. And... Um, this is this is equitable. This is fair in reopening the union contract and extending it out <clears throat> additional two years is a, is a great idea. It, it's fair for them, just as the eight percent for the rest of our employees was fair earlier this year. Uh, excuse me, last year. So I fully intend to support this. Just a clarification: this is not a one-time bonus. This is going into this will be eight percent increase in base salaries for all employees. Is that correct? Correct. So this will. And I understand you're recommending that the cost of this be taken um, out of some of our ARPA funds? Correct, and I'll cover that in another F. Okay. But before I finish, I want to say this also, I think, to me, points why our making uh, additional pension payments is essential because this is going to impact our pension payments. Uh, we're increasing base salaries, which increases pensions. Um, but with the extra money we're putting in and the lower multiplier, we can absorb this in a way that we wouldn't be if we were making the minimum um, annual contribution. So thank you again for bringing this to us. Thank you. 
Um, so do I have a motion, Mr. Hendrickson? So I, I think then based on um, the manager's comments with regard to um, 14C, it would be prudent to move to table this resolution, uh, on this action item, until our March 7th meeting. So okay. I'll go ahead and make that motion. Sure. And that's for item 14C specifically? Yes. All right. The, the, Mr. DeShane? Excuse me. We need to vote on that motion first. Call. Yes. Other comments? Then um, the motion is to table item 14C. Mr. Lemaster, I believe we'll take a roll call vote in this instance. Yes. Trustee Hendrickson? Yes. Trustee Sunland? Yes. Trustee Wilson? Yes. Trustee Wazinski? Yes. Supervisor Jackson? Yes. Clerk Guthrie? Yes. Motion carried 7 0. Thank you. That item is tabled and we move to 14 D. Need a new motion? Mr. DeShane. Thank you. I move to approve the township manager's recommendation to approve the attached wage increase as presented, including an extension of the current employment contract with the Police Officers Association of Michigan through December 31st, 2026. Supported by Trustee Wazinski. Mr. DeShane? Um, I think the manager had some more. He wanted to, to, to speak to this one. I'd like to hear from him on, on the item D. Um, Actually, I've said um, all that I probably could say about it. We have a group um, that um, we really need to take a look at, as we've been saying for a long t for a number of months. We need to take a look at our public uh, safety employees, both police and fire, and bring them more aligned for what we've done with other team members. And this is a group that really deserves the boost, and that's why it's before you tonight. Okay. Trustee Wazinski. <laughs> I just want to commend the manager for taking this opportunity and recognizing again, having that forethought, that um, that equity amongst our our, our staff, um, and, and specifically our police and fire. And I know this isn't an easy task, and I think we have the best possible outcome. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I'll I'll add to the chorus of those who are thanking the manager for taking a very proactive step here. Um, it would be very easy for the township to sit on the current contract um, for the next two years, um, delaying what would be, what is a common sense uh, amendment to that contract. Um, and so I think this is a, a, an excellent proactive move from the township and one that I um, think also, especially given the current circumstances, will allow us to show some appreciation to um, those members of our police and fire bargaining units. Um, so thank you to Manager Walsh for doing that. I'll be supporting this motion. Yeah. Other comments? Then Mr. DeShane. Yes, it's, it's referenced earlier that this will be paid for by a recommendation to take $270,000 from the ARPA funds that we had set aside for the new community center, senior center, and move them into this pay increase. And as a member of that task force, it does not seem like they were going to be spending that money this year. It, that, that's a long-term project, and well, that money may eventually make a contribution. We will have other ways to, to put that money back in future years. This is more important. This is, this is essential to show this recognition and provide the equity for our police and fire. So I appreciate the, the suggestion to move this money from the ARPA funds. So we're not just giving these fair wage increases to our firefighters and police. We're, we're paying for it at the same time. Um, and I have one question, Mr. Walsh. These go into effect um, immediately upon passage? Correct. If it's approved this evening by the board, it would take effect with payroll in 72 hours. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. LeMaster, can we get a roll call vote for item 14E, which is the wage adjustment contract extension consideration 
D. 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 I'm sorry. Um, for police officers association, police officers association of Michigan. Trustee Hendrickson. Yes. Trustee Sundland. Yes. Trustee Wilson. Yes. Trustee Wazinski. Yes. Supervisor Jackson. Yes. Clerk Guthrie. Yes. Treasurer DeShane. Yes. Motion carried seven zero. And Thank then. You. Thank you. Mr. Ross. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Item 14E is the same kind of consideration for the police supervisory unit. Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I move to approve the Township Manager's recommendation to approve the attached wage increase as presented, including an extension of the current employment contract with the Meridian Township Police Supervisory Unit through December 31, 2026. Second. So, supported by Trustee Sunderland. Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. Um, I think that everything I said about the last <laughs> resolution <laughs> also applies to this one. Um, this will move, I think, all but one, then, of our con con collective bargaining agreements to this uh, arrangement. Um, this is a step closer to equity amongst all of our employees, and I applaud it. So thank you. Trustee Sunderland? Yeah, oh, no, this mean? is just um, keeping in line with what what we're doing as a township to um, provide support for all of our staff. Very important to keep their um, get, keep their interest and in, know that they're appreciated. Thank you. Any further comments, Mr. Lemaster? Trustee yes. Sundland. Yes. Trustee Wilson. Yes. Trustee Wazinski. Yes. Supervisor Jackson. Yes. Clerk Guthrie. Yes. Treasurer DeShane. Yes. Trustee Hendrickson. Yes. Motion carried 7-0. Thank you. I would I would note, uh, Madam Supervisor Board, that Sergeant Squires is here this evening. I didn't know if I'm um, from the command unit. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to, if there was anything you wanted to say. I would offer you the opportunity. As uh, the manager said, Kurt Squires uh, with the command unit, uh, I do uh, appreciate. I want to take this uh, second to uh, appreciate your uh, unanimous support from the board, supervisor, the manager, uh, chief's office, HR. Uh, we appreciate your support um, and continued support, uh, like you said, especially at this time. Um, but uh, it's uh, nice to have uh, this continued support. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Item 14F, redesignation of American Rescue Plan or ARP funds. Mr. Mo Mr. Walsh. As Treasurer DeSane uh, indicated, uh, we're requesting that $300,000 be moved from the uh, account of that was earmarked for the Senior Community Center over to um, pay for this. We are able to absorb this increase in 24 uh, moving forward, but it's not in this year's budget, so we're trying to not have a hole in the 23 budget. So we're rec recommending that $300,000 from the American Rescue Plan be transferred to the general fund to cover the cost. Okay. Questions, comments, a motion? Mr. Deshane. I move to approve the recommendation from the Township Manager and Finance Director to transfer $300,000 originally earmarked for the Senior Community Center Feasibility Study from the American Rescue Plans to the General Fund. Support. Support by Mr. Hendrickson. Further comments? No further comments. No further comments. Mr. Hendrickson? Uh, ordinarily, I would take slight issue with the fact that we're moving money for all three when only two have been approved, but we can always move it back. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so there we are. Clerk Griffin. Thank you, uh, Madam Supervisor. I just um, wanted to say that I think this is a good use of funds, a much better use of funds that I appreciate um, the manager and our HR director um, 
working with our police and fire teams on these contracts um, for better wages for them, for retention, for training, um, and um, the job that they're doing here at Meridian Township. I think it's important um, when we're competing against others across the state that we uh, retain the officers uh, that we're investing in. So thank you for um, putting this together and I, I think this is much better use of funds. Thank you. Other board members? Then the um, motion is um, to approve the recommendation from the manager and finance director to transfer $300,000 originally earmarked for a senior community center feasibility study. Mr. LeMaster, I believe we need a roll call vote. Trustee Wilson? Yes. Trustee Wazinski? Yes. Supervisor Jackson? Yes. Clerk Guthrie? Yes. Treasurer DeShane? Yes. Trustee Hendrickson? Yes. Trustee Sundland? Yes. Motion carried 7-0. Thank you, Mr. Thank Walsh. you. If I may, <clears throat> just make Please. one suggestion that the board may want to take up. The weather report on the west side of the state along the lakefront is already starting to uh, turn, not for the best. And I know we have some guests here who are here for 15B, um, and they need to drive back to the lakeshore. So mm -hmm. I'll leave that up to you whether you change your agenda or not. Thank you. All right. Mr. Lamar, uh, we are at... Discussion items. Mr. Walsh has made a suggestion. Is there a motion to make that switch? Mr. Henderson? Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I move um, that we amend our agenda to take up item 15B before item 15A as printed on our uh, agenda. Support. Okay. Um, all in favor of that motion, please say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes unanimously move to hazard uh, 15b hazard village square commercial rehabilitation exemption application hello hello all right included in your packet is the application for the exemption that we held a public hearing for earlier uh, this evening so it is again the same project 1621 and 1655 hazlet road comprises about 19 and a half acres of what we kind of consider blighted, um, vacant, com now completely vacant commercial properties. It does include the two very scary looking houses at the soon to be vacated Raby Road, Raby Road, so I'm very excited to see those go as well. Uh, the whole project should include about 290 housing units through various stacked flats and some townhouses in the back and an additional um, update to the park trail at the interurban trailhead with bathrooms. Tonight the board um, is to discuss the application as presented. You have a resolution attached that you would adopt and the adoption of that resolution would allow myself to submit the application to the STC for the exemption. Um, the application essentially says that the abatement is is no more than is less than 5% of the total taxable value of Meridian Township, which it does calculate that way. It's a 10-year abatement, specifies the property, and mm, I think it was in May or June of last year when the district for the um, rehab area was established. So we are well on the right way to get this uh, into STC's hands, as well as on the other half, uh, back-end work that I'm doing for this project helping to make sure that the developers get the signed agreements for the Brownfield plan from MEDC. So I'm hoping to have those lined up at the same time so that demolition can occur in the spring like we hope. Okay. So, so board, we, we have, um, um, what is before us is the approval mechanism, which, and so I guess at, right after the public hearing, where we um, have um, done our due diligence. The question is whether or not we are ready to put it on the agenda at our ne at next meeting for a decision about approval and of the, um, based on the requirements for approval. Comment? Mr. Hendrickson. 
Um, thank you, Madam Supervisor. Director Clark, I didn't notice any substantive changes to the application since it was before us, what, four months ago? Yes. Is that accurate? Correct. Then the, I would have the, the largest change is the date. That is right. effectively the only change that I have. Sure. So I would have, I supported it then, I support it now. Okay. I say we put it on our next agenda. Is that the, the consensus? Then we will expect to see it at our next regular meeting. I will bring it back for action. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will now go to um, item 15A, recreational marijuana ordinances. Um, we're in an ongoing discussion with Mr. Schmidt. <coughs> oh, it's with all of us, not just me. <laughs> um, and I have with us this evening uh, one of the attorneys um, from uh, Faye Schultz. Verchick? Yeah, Verchick. Faye Schultz, Verzik Roads. Verzik Roads. Um, Chuck Cunningham. Um, so after the last meeting of the Township Board, there was some feedback that we got, and the Township Board asked that this matter come back this evening for discussion, and then we were also having a work session next Tuesday, the 28th, to discuss this topic. So uh, I'll be brief this evening. Um, it, there were function. just as a reminder, there are sort of three pieces to this process, the zoning ordinance updates, with the, which the Planning Commission has reviewed, recommended approval of, uh, would also recommend, they did also recommend that we include grow operations potentially on Hagedorn Road. The licensing piece for both recreational and changes to the medical licensing to bring it all into compliance with each other. Uh, so they all talk together and, and the licensing piece is what uh, Trent and Matt Kushel, our uh, the township attorney who's regularly working on this, have been working on over the past several months. And so we brought that all together at the February 7th meeting. There are a couple of minor changes that we did uh, incorporate into the ordinance based on the feedback we got. We did um, change the ordinances as necessary to limit to one licensed premises per overlay, which was the direction of the board. And we um, did make a minor change to the zoning ordinance um, based on that feedback. Uh, so we incorporated those couple of items. There's still plenty more to talk about, obviously. Um, we're happy to um, take those topics down this evening and be re prepared to follow up on them, follow up on them at the meeting next Tuesday or we can um, attempt to answer them this evening. I will say that uh, both Trent and I uh, know what we're talking about, but we'll defer a lot of the licensing um, minutia to Mr. Kushel uh, next Tuesday. Um, anything, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, so I'm Trent Cunningham. Uh, I work at Fahey Schultz Perzik Roads. I'm actually a third year, find my final year of law school at Michigan State, so I just want to you know, I appreciate as a student of Michigan State the comments this board made tonight. But I've been working with attorney Matt Kushel on this project a lot and um, just looking forward to getting some feedback from the board tonight and taking it back to him and working on it and hopefully uh, giving you guys some answers going forward. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. So if there, are, um, if there are any specific topics that you would like us to be prepared to discuss next Tuesday or have any questions that are still burning, now would be an excellent time to provide them to me. Get ready to put it. <laughs> Anyone ready? Uh, Trustee Wilson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. Uh, I've got a couple of things on my mind as I've been looking at this ordinance over the last couple weeks. Um, we have an attorney who we contract with who prosecutes all of our cases. Uh, that's uh, Colin Harkness at the Correct. Harkness Law Firm. Has he had an opportunity to review this ordinance for um, following the law? I mean, how would he go about, how, how does he view it in terms of, does the language support um, having a misdemeanor, having some kind of prosecution of a misdemeanor if the law is not followed or the ordinance is not followed? Has he weighed in on this at all? No, it's it's not something. That's it, an interesting question. It's not something we would normally kick over to our prosecuting attorneys. Um, I'm happy to have that conversation with them. Um, yeah, let me 
Let me get back to you on that, on okay. that issue. I appreciate that. Also, I was thinking about um, we get a lot of biased reporting, pro and con, about the public health impact. And yes. it's hard to dissect who's behind the publication. Is there any resource? Have we gone to, say, our public health director in Ingham County to ascertain what the truth is? about um, marijuana usage. I just read a recent article that um, now the number one adolescent um, use is marijuana. And I, I'm not saying I'm for or against, but uh, do have we seen anything that is not biased in terms of, could we bring anything forward from CDC, I, you know, um, IS, I'm going to say the acronym wrong, from the uh, National Institute of Health, anything that we could really, that's really solid that well, we could look at? I mean, I think one of the issues that you run into with something like that is marijuana is a, a scheduled drug, and you haven't been able to, <coughs> to, to get federal funding to study it over the years. And so mm -hmm. that's it, what you're finding is that these, the information is coming from sources that aren't as rock solid as the CDC. Yeah. Um, Happy to look into it a little further. I can tell you that any time I've looked into something on this topic, I've also looked into who's writing it. Um, exactly. It's, the, it's also become sort of my standard operating procedure on anything nowadays, uh, is what's the source. But uh, happy to look into it a little further. But I think that is the main problem here, is that there's been a difficulty in getting federal funding for, for studying this topic. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Dishon. Thank you. Um, appreciate, appreciate you coming to us to ask us what things we want to look at in our study session to make the most use of that time. I think it would be useful to have Prosecutor Harkness there. I mean, if we were going to rewrite our minor in possession of alcohol rules today, we would want to talk to him because he's the one that, that prosecutes those, writes those tickets for, for those misdemeanors. And so I think the impact, the enforceability, if you will, of any ordinance, licensing ordinance, I think would be valuable. I have a couple of questions I'd like to look into, and that is, what are we expecting to be the gross annual sales of these stores based on current data out there? The figure, back of the envelope, envelope, back of the envelope figure I came up with a couple of years ago was about $2 million per store. You took that just to buy, divide in the gross sales of the number of stores in Michigan at the time, came up with a figure of $2 million. Is that still operating number? Has it increased? Has it decreased? And I'd also like to know what product are they going to be selling? Let's say it comes out of two million store. How does that break out in terms of, you know, gummy bears compared to liquids compared to uh, leaf products? I'd like to know how that would reach the consumer um, per store. Just averages, of course. Another figure I've came across in doing some research was these ratios of number of stores per population. There's a group called the. Public Health Institute, which is funded by the Hilton Foundation, that said in California they recommended one store per 15,000 people. Now, for the Washington State uses a figure of one store per 22,000 people. These guidelines they work with, are these statute, are these recommended, are these in dispute? But what are those ratios? Word appears to be looking at five per store, which would be about one per 8,000 people. Um, but those ratios match up with what other states are using as, as, as guidelines. Uh, Lynn Page sent us a whole lot of information on the public health aspect of it. And I guess with you, we've got to find, we've had 10 years of legalization in Colorado, California, um, and less time in Washington, and obviously less time here in Michigan. But there has to be some data-based research out there with some in, information on the, the health effects of recreational marijuana. And if we can find that, if we can bring that forward, it would be useful. Particularly because the, the, the group that seems to impact most are those with still forming, still plastic brains, which is that 18 to 25 year old age group, that cohort. And those are also the, the most likely to, to be consumers of this, of this product that's legalized. And so what happens in states that legalize it to consumption by that group? 
and do we have any data from the, what that consumption do, increased consumption does? That would be really useful stuff to know, I think. So again, as much as you can bring it to us on public health data that's been done from, from states that have also uh, legalized ratios, and then what we how much marijuana sales should we expect per store once we agree to pass the zoning and licensing laws that ordinances that allow that? So, thanks for asking. Trustee Sunny, uh, isn't the legal age of recreational marijuana 21 to purchase? What is that legal age? Yeah, yeah, that, it's 21. Yeah, for recreational, it's 21. Yeah, yeah. so we're talking about, <clears throat> you know, the public and access and, um, you know, I don't know how you, you know, any time, anything that is legal, you know, how do you, how do you keep the kids from indulging? You know, I mean, I, I think it's probably going to be an age-old um, issue, um, alcohol, marijuana. Um, and I, I understand that you're saying that the recreational marijuana is becoming the drug of use. But, um, yeah, so I was just wanted to clarify that the legal age is 21 to purchase. Recreational. Uh, Trustee Wazinski. I have a few questions that I was hoping to get some additional, thank you, Supervisor, <laughs> to get some uh, additional um, information potentially and or, or uh, for, for our study session. Um, mm -hmm. Three main questions. My first main question is, um, well, this is a sub-question that's going to be before the main question. <laughs> um, so the title of this particular ordinance is uh, proposed to be changed to uh, marijuana regulations. So question to Director Schmidt is, does that include currently within this ordinance, and I've tried to delineate and I, I just can't do it myself, but does that include currently both recreational and medical? Oh, uh, that's right, we'll, tra we'll change it in the top header. Um, so what that, uh, okay, so the, the main header for that section right now has a different reference, and so what that first um, clause is doing is it's retitling it to cover everything, and then there's a subcategory for med, um, medical, and there will be a subcategory for recreational. So it's a, more of a housekeeping change. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, second question is regarding current permit holders, and I think I, we may have touched on this last time, but um, the current permit holders have invested pretty significantly into the township already and didn't have an opportunity to be successful given multiple reasons, but one of them being COVID. Um, so that, you know, restricted many things, including building, um, permitting, uh, production, supplies. So I'm wondering if that's something we can't bring to the study group is how can we be fair to those who have already invested significantly into our community um, with the medical permit in hand. Um, I, I, I know there's a lot of questions with that, and I have that too. But I'm hoping that we can we can talk about that further, um, <coughs> how we might be able to be pro business and um, encouraging to those folks that have already you know committed to be um, to invest. The other one that I would like to discuss a little further, and I think we touched on it, and I'm not sure where we landed on as a board, but the grow operation. Um, so as I understand it, we had not received any applications for grow, transport, or processing in the past. And I'm wondering, um, is there Outside of zoning, is there another reason we want to include GROW in the new ordinance? So, um, correct. We've not received any interest in that in the past. That's um, The current ordinance is set up 
prohibiting everything essentially but retail sales. The Planning Commission at the last minute kind of got a thought of maybe adding the idea of a grow operation in the Hagedorn Road overlay. Um, it would need to be incorporated into all of the ordinances because when this is done, they're going to all act in concert. Mm -hmm. Because there's obviously was a concern. Well, you might issue five over here and five over here. That's not going to be the case. These are all going to play together in the sandbox in the end. So the um, input that we took from the last meeting was that there was not a desire to do that because it potentially opened us up to litigation by only having it in one location. Um, if the board wants to circle back on that, we can. It's it is going to take us uh, some work to reincorporate everything. I'm not suggesting that. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> I was just, I, I didn't know where we landed on that, yeah. and I didn't, I didn't see it. Okay. What you have in front of you has, it has taken the language out, and it's clear that grow operations under any circumstances are not permitted. Excellent. Thank you. Um, third question. And I'll, I'll leave the rest for our study session. But another thing I would like to talk about further is transfer of application. Um, currently, we prohibit that extensively um, for 30 for 30 months, which is two and a half years. Um, and just reflecting on the last two and a half years, we can't predict how the the market nor the um, supply chain or construction um, might be affected. So it's just something I'd like to talk about a little bit more. Um, I know there's more than one option when it comes to transfer, so it doesn't necessarily have to be yes or no. So maybe something else we can discuss at the, um, at the study session. And I think I'll leave the rest for the study session alone. Those are my top three that I, I felt could use more discussion on my end. Uh, I can say that the question of transfers is one that we've been working on so far, so we plan to have that one um, ready for the okay. study session. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I think um, uh, Trustee Wazinski um, asked a few of the questions that I had, so thank you. Um, so I guess my my perspective or question would be in regards to um, the amount of work that this requires on staff and how the township prepares to handle that on the back end um, and in regards to anything because I'm with trustee um, Wilson regarding so many different reports on public safety needs and this and that, that I'm not really sure what's accurate. Um, do we need, if, if there's a grow operation, do we need an auto the ladder truck? If there's, how do we do code enforcement? Do, you know, do these things need to be really beefed up or looked at or anything like that? Um, and then my other, so that's something that I would like to know at, at the study session. Um, is what kind of um, staff strength this requires and any budgetary concerns that we would need to be aware of in regards to a new type of business that we haven't had in the township before that we may need to address. Um, and then I brought, at the last meeting, I brought up um, curbside service, drive-through service. Um, and when I look at this ordinance, I. I wasn't originally on the board when this was made, and I know the planning. I understand the planning commission's recommendations. Um, I still have concerns regarding um, the ability for people to get in and out of their vehicles, going um, in and out of a facility, um, having access, um, providing equity to people who aren't as mobile as other people. Um, so I still would like to know in the study session what that would look like, if that's something that we can do as part of what's already been written. Um, I don't really know those things. Um, so I would, I, would, I would like to know that and have that discussion in the study session. 
Um, I think those are my main, um, my two biggest, I mean, there's a few other things that I think I can stay safe for the study session, but those are the two biggest things that I wanted, wanted to learn, learn from it to present to you tonight. Absolutely. So um, I have several questions that we relate specifically to the ordinances that we're looking at. So what we have, what, what you're saying to us at this point is that we have agreed on the structure of the overlay districts because the sizes have been re reduced in some of them. Is that correct? I'm, I'm certainly okay. not speaking for the board in terms of what we've agreed on it. Oh, okay. This was what you have is staff's recommendation of the Planning Commission, which then made a positive recommendation to the board. Right. If there's further discussion that needs to happen, obviously that's what we're here for. Okay. But but what what they one of the things they did was to reduce the size. That some of, of the, the feedback they gave us was re with respect to the size, and so we told them that's what you take a second to us. look at it, and we found some areas where obvious changes could be made to further reduce the potential expansion in the future. Okay. Uh, and and you eliminated one of the. I think we had six in the beginning. We eliminated two. There were two overlays. Uh, there was a second overlay on the Don Avenue area that we eliminated uh, at the at uh, both Director Clark and myself's recommendation uh, to not put further pressure on the industrial districts in the township, and we eliminated the district uh, that was on Towner Towner Road, mm -hmm. which was always a, a bit of a difficult development proposition. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so at this at this point, I am uh, in support of of those changes that you've made. Um, the uh, number four and on Hagedorn Road. Yes, I'm presuming that the the reason the idea of growth um, came up was because of the um, zoning, underlying zoning on that particular site. So there, there is a path under the existing medical that would allow a potential grow operation, but no one has chosen to take us up on that. So far. And so given that that was the last remaining one in the discussion we heard, it was, uh, at this point, it is not in the ordinance. It, it has been taken out of the ordinance at this time. At, at this yes. point, okay, okay. I, I, um, I, I think I would like to reconsider <laughs> um, that possibility of a smaller um, type of facility. I think one of the um, suggestions. And the proposal was a um, micro business class, a micro whatever class A, and um, I recognize why um, I would say entrepreneurs are not particularly excited about that possibility, but due to the zoning difference between that site and all of our other sites, which are commercial sites, um, is there no value or can, can we find no value in the possibility of that different kind of facility on that site? And I, I do remember that at the last time we talked about this, there was um, discussion about whether or not you would allow growing a small amount of growing on this site based on its underlying zoning and not allow it on the other five sites, or the other four sites. But it, it, just in general, I'm not, um, I, I think, I guess in my mind, I'm not finished with that, with thinking about that, <laughs> I had that idea. Understood. Um, but basically, the idea is it, 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 it is possible to um, 
allow a grow type of operation, small grow type of operation on that particular site because of this underlying zoning. So we'll leave that as a question for the time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the an, another thing is, so we're talking about um, the possibility of five recreational permits. Correct. And yet we have five medical permits. Correct. But sort of. Um, the, the, we have five pre-approved licensees, none of which have actually received a permit because none of them have ever gotten to the point of operations. Our ordinance is set up on the medical side in a, a multi-tiered system. So you go through the lottery, which you get pre-qualified which means you have all the application information. You go through the lottery and you're selected. You then go through the special use permit process, get your special use permit. You then get your building permits, state approval, and then we come in at the end. They're functionally at the same time as the state approval at the end when you're ready to open. So that nobody has actually gotten to the point of a permit. Um, several have gotten close down that line. The, the I think what we're trying to do with the ordinance is to not double dip and get have 10, I think, mm, is right. the, the point. We've said this all along, that the, the idea would be that there would be some overlap, and it would be one sort of licensed premises or one license within each of the overlays, uh, as opposed to one medical and one recreational. So let's, let's go back for a minute. No one has a permit. No one has qualified for, has gotten a permit for Meridian Township. Correct. But five applicants have state licenses for medical marijuana sales. Because they have to yes, get they that. Yes, they're pre-approved under the, they have, they have um, is it pre-approval? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's pre-approval with the state as well, that okay. they get pre-approved as a business with a location to be determined. Uh, do they have, and, and they also have what are called, what are considered Laurel licenses for medical marijuana? They would not have, in the, the they, would not, they would not have their license yet because they do not have an approved location. The licenses are granted to individual locations. All of the five are in this like interstitial space of moving towards the goal, but have not gotten far enough to actually have issuance at the goal. Issuance from the state or from the township? Both. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so um, but all of them have all of them pass the um, special use permit on a site? No. Uh, acquired a uh, special permit use permit on a site? All of the special site. use permits are expired and they are, are needing to renew. They have uh, expired. Yes. This, the, the, again, the medical ordinance has um, different criteria than the underlying special use permit requirements. Um, and so four of the five need to go through the process of special use permit application again. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about, um, so if you, only have five sites and you potentially have 10 licenses, uh, 10 permits, five medical and five recreational. How, did, how does that work? 
We're happy to get into the details of how we expect that to work at the work session. We'll follow okay. up on that. Okay. Um, and back to a question I raised at the last meeting. Is there any way to um, ensure that all facilities have both kinds of licenses? Uh, again, we, as we talked about last time, I think that's going to come with the um, review criteria, just sort of the next step of this process. Um, we do. It does not appear as though we can require them to have both okay. legally. But it may be a situation where if you have both, it's a benefit to you under the review process. OK. Mr. Hendricks. That actually raises um, a point that I was that raises a point that I was curious about. Um, which I'd like to explore um, at the study session, which is my understanding from our last meeting was that there is a separate policies and procedures for application for the application process or a separate you know document of some kind where we lay out a rubric for the uh, application process wherein we could you know, that's just for lack of a better way of putting it, assign points for various qualifications that an applicant may provide. And so we could theoretically say if you already have a medical SUP approved in the township, that would get you a certain number of points, which could advantage those previously permit, permit limbo applicants uh, for um, getting approved for a adult use recreational license. Is that accurate? That's certainly something that can be taken into account okay. during the scoring process. So I think it would be helpful at the study session to outline sort of what does or what could or could not go into that process, what the next steps in this process are after the zoning ordinance is considered and the non-zoning ordinance is considered. Um, there also seems to be some discussion as to, you know, holding multiple permits, you know, we're not talking about having 10, right? My understanding is that the medical ordinance as it exists today will more or less be no more and be subsumed by this ordinance. Is that it's, accurate? That's not accurate. <laughs> the medical and the recreational would exist side by side because they eat, both have their own criteria for how you get to an actual permit to sell. Right. And they are they have different enabling legislation that has its own nuances, so they have to be kept separate if the intention is to allow both meta and rec. Okay. I think, I don't speak for everyone on the board, of course, but my sense of things based on previous discussions that we've had is that no one intends for there to be 10 establishments we agree okay <laughs> um, so I think the the application project process and procedures is something I might like talk about um, sounds like we're already going to be talking about transfers um, at the study session so that's helpful um, something that I meant uh, I'll say that I'm overall very happy with where what I see on paper here right that's I think we're in a pretty good spot to, to you know get into the very nitty-gritty of it um, the only thing that I, I flagged as, you know, and I talked about this last time, was the, the sign discrepancy, right? And I understand that we find ourselves in a weird sign limbo world where um, signs can be regulated for marijuana establishments differently than for anywhere else, um, given the way we are um, addressing signs in our sign ordinance update. Um, I wonder, however, since we are consolidating all the sign language into one comprehensive sign update, if we should be instead referencing in this ordinance the fact that if you want to know about signs, you can look for it in the sign ordinance and have it in there instead. I tried. Um, <laughs> this is literally the only sign ordinance reference now outside of the sign ordinance, Ooh, okay. uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Kushel would recommend that we keep it here. Okay. okay. Well, we like doing what Mr. Kushel says. <laughs> um, and lastly, and I think it's, it's, it would be helpful for us to discuss this at our study session, um, 
so that we can be as clear as we can be with the, you know, the public who has been hearing us talk about this issue for now many, many years. Um, I think we should discuss um, what timing we should all expect for this ordinance's rollout um, because it's been something that we've been working on for a while. Staff has clearly put in a lot of effort into this. Our attorneys have put into a lot of effort into this, and a lot of members of this board have put in a lot of effort into this um, and making sure that we get it done right um, and that it reflects the values of the community. Um, and so having a sense of when this can be expected, I think is good for us to sort of give ourselves a goal. It's also good for those businesses, as Trustee Wazinski pointed out, uh, who have made an effort to um, you know, sort of get their foot in the door and, and, and make an investment into the community already, uh, for them to understand where, where our thoughts are. Um, I think it's important for us to be upfront with them, and I think that some discussion by this body on that topic would be of value as well. Um, so. That's what I've got for now. Thank you. Trustee Wazinski. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. One more. Um, regarding, it, because it came up in conversation already, uh, commence, uh, commence operations. So I would like to look at that a little bit further, at least have discussion about um, the timing for commencing operations. Currently, it's, it's set at uh, within 18 months, and the board would have the ability to increase it to six months um, you know, given justification. And again, looking at some supply shortages and some other things, just would like to have that conversation as well. Yeah, absolutely. I can tell you that I believe that language actually came from the industry the first time through. Okay. Because they did not want people to get these licenses and sit on them. So sure. Okay. That's exactly what happened. Trustee uh, Clerk Guthrie. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. Uh, since this was mentioned um, with uh, Trustee Hendrickson, is there is there a reason why medical and recreational would exist side by side, and it, and recreational just want to consume the medical or medical? I mean, nothing's been built. No one's. There's so there's two answers to that question. Okay. From a statewide perspective, there are two enabling legislations. They have two different sets of guidelines of how you handle things under them. So if you want to have both of them, you have to have two separate licensing standards. Mm -hmm. The second more question, more to the point, is if you don't want one or the other, you just get rid of that one and just go with the one, which is our current system, that we allow medical but not recreational. Can we get rid of medical and just have recreational since no one's done medical? Uh, I take my direction from the board. I'm a whole bunch <laughs> but, that's an, but that's an option, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Does that pose a problem with any, we don't have any permits, right? I, I, happy to discuss that further. Uh, okay. Session. <laughs> that's, I, that's a punt to Mr. Cushel right there. It's yeah. <laughs> a punt to not having a red light. <laughs> I, I would um, add at this point that I am not in favor of um, not having or pre pre not permitting medical. And my preference would be both okay. in the same facility, but that's my preference. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, that, that enough to keep you busy for Not at all. Uh, we're safe for another half hour. Uh, we have plenty of information and notes, and we will be prepared to talk uh, next Tuesday. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is 15C. This is um, um, an informational presentation by Mr. Walsh. Something. Right. The Board of Water Light allows for a seat on the board every four years from Reading Township. This started in 2015 uh, with the appointment of Mike Fro, who lives in the Wardcliffe neighborhood. And the uh, board appointed him in 2015. And again in 2019, Mike Fro represented Meridian Township. 2023, July 1, uh, will begin um, a one-year cycle for Meridian Township. I'm just bringing it up tonight to letting you know the BWL, the Board of Water and Light, contacted me last week to let me know, bringing it forward to you this evening so you can ponder that. Think about how you want to move forward over the next couple of months. 
Thank you. Questions, comments, Mr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Madam Supervisor. Has anyone reached out to Mr. Fro? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, as far as I know. Uh, no, I would not do that unless, I, I the, the, unless the board has. <laughs> and, and no one else had. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, Trustee Wilson. I have Wilson. a question. Uh, what portion of the township is covered by board of water and light? It's a tiny fraction, isn't it? It is. It is. So it's is it only Warcliffe? Yeah. A it's, portion it's, of Warcliffe? It's more, it's more, it's more than Warcliffe. 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 It's more than
uh, an alternate, alternate, alternate date for them? An alternate date um, post March 7th or post March 7th, I think would work for the developer in any case. I know that they would like to meet with staff. That's for us to decide. Um, I think there are a few members of the public that would also like this public discussion about the project to be separate from a board, board, from meeting. board meeting. Mm -hmm. So if that was the case, then the board would pick any other day. Okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Supervisor. I know Excuse me. Do we do we have to cancel it since we've already notified the public? Can we have an informational meeting? Take questions that we take back to the developers at a future meeting date, or is that a, you set the meeting? It's your decision. I I think the point was for the yeah. developer to tell the public who was raising all the questions. Yeah their answers to the to the questions. Um, so that's not something anyone else on this board is interested in. <laughs> They're like, hell no. <laughs> no, no, no. We have to have a meeting, let's not have it. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not the case, but just <laughs> Mr. Deshane. I agree with the entire supervisor. We do not want to be the spokespersons for this. For the developer. No, the and developer needs to be here and answer to the public. And this meeting was the brainchild of Trustee Wilson to, because we're getting so much feedback yeah. on next door as to what's going on. Why is the township dragging its feet in this? Why, why, why are they so inept about redeveloping down in Alchemist? As if we own the property, it was up to us to sign the building permits or the construction agreements. This is not our project. This is the developer's project. We want them to speak for this project. I do think we should suggest an alternative of date for this um, and mm -hmm. give them another two weeks or so to meet. And I also like the idea of being outside of the township board meeting so we're not time limited yes. by 60 minutes I uh, agree. for this. Okay, so Trustee Wilson. I totally agree they, that the public doesn't deserve to hear from us and doesn't want to hear from us. They want to hear from the developers. So I would suggest that we go back to the developer and get some dates when they are available that they will commit to because this is so frustrating for us and all of our residents to be left hanging again without having any kind of communication. Um, Mr. Um, Deshane. Your suggestion was a later date than March, than March the 7th and a non-meeting date. Correct. Pick one. <laughs> and let's offer it. It depends on when they kick. Yeah. Yeah, but they'll tell us. How about if we offer March 28th? Okay. It's an off-meeting night. We'll go back to them and say this Tuesday is Tuesday night? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it would be the only topic. It yes. Only topic. That's the point of the meeting. Okay. I can do. I will have to put you in. You're welcome. We would appreciate that. Um, welcome to item 16. Comments from the public. Are there members of the public left to comment? Seeing none, are there other matters and board member comments? Then we stand adjourned. You have to have a motion. Do I have to have a motion? Yes. Can I get a motion to adjourn? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll second. All right. All in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say yes. 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 Polls no. We are adjourned. <laughs>